Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our Marine Science Day today. We are excited to have attendees from all over the world with us today. My name is Candace Vincent, and I will be your host for this session. In this session, Val Kells, world-renowned scientific illustrator, will be providing an introduction to scientific illustration. After a short presentation, we will have a Q&A session in which Val will answer your questions. Now, I will turn it over to Val, and thank you so much for joining us, Val. We're so lucky to have you. Good morning. Hi, everybody. My name is Val Kells, and uh, I hope that I bring you a little bit of inspiration and education and leave you uh, with things to think about. And for those budding scientific illustrators out there, Yahoo. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my beginnings. And if you want to know more, please feel free to ask uh, by a series of very roundabout and <laughs> twisted webby uh, decisions and forks in the road. I ultimately landed at UC Santa Cruz where I fell into the science illustration program completely by accident. I was there to complete my marine biology degree and found the science illustration program and the little light bulb went off and I knew exactly what I was going to do with my life. I was going to combine my love for the ocean with my weird quirky artwork and become a marine science illustrator. This is one of the first covers that I published uh, in 1984. If you're familiar with my work, you can tell that I've come a long way. Uh, I found this when I was packing to move back to Kitty Hawk Bay. Um, cheers from Kitty Hawk Bay. These are my most recent covers. You can see there's been kind of an evolution. In 2011, I published a field guide to coastal fishes from Maine to Texas. In 2013, field guide to fish to Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Maine to Texas took five and a half years to develop. Uh, Chesapeake Bay was about four years. In 2016, I segued into the Pacific. <laughs> Might as well, got a call, say, hey, Val, you want to do the Pacific? I said, sure, why not? And most recently, in 2019, we published two books, which is uh, pretty unprecedented. And the uh, Tunas and Billfishes of the World went on to win the Smithsonian Science Achievement Award, uh, which was really cool. And I'm currently working on my seventh book for Johns Hopkins University Press, which will cover fishes from Bermuda, Bahamas, and the Caribbean Sea. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, as a sidebar, I also illustrated for over 30 aquariums, museums, and nature centers around the world. I also uh, do folding guides, note cards, and posters. As a freelance illustrator, I have a lot of balls in the air and a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, and that keeps things very, very interesting. I've got to stay super organized. Let's talk about science illustration versus illustration. So as a scientific illustrator, it's my job to illustrate marine life, aquatic life more precisely, as they appear in nature, not as I would want them to appear in my head. There's no room for artistic license per se. I've developed my own style and each scientific illustrator has their own style, but I do not make things up. So this is a representation of two illustrations, obviously one made on a, on a pad and um, with a stylus and then, and then mine. They're both ba banded sunfishes, but mine is, has to be scientifically accurate. I illustrate living fishes. Uh, above is a live dolphin fish. Below is a dead dolphin fish. While I might get some information from the dead fish, I illustrate fishes as they appear alive and well at the surface of the water. I also illustrate fishes <laughs> that haven't been sitting in a bucket. So the one above was freshly seined out of the marsh behind Ocracoke Island, North Carolina, and the ones below have been sitting in a bucket. And you can see that they're completely blanched. And while they're the same species, I wouldn't use the ones below uh, for living color. I also have to illustrate them not hiding in a hole. Lots of fishes hide, they're swimming, their fins are down, they're moving. 
So my job is to illustrate fishes facing left with all of their fins raised um, in healthy colors, like I said, at the surface, male, female, juveniles, everything in between. This is a, uh, a frozen bull eye that a friend of mine preserved for me. That's my son <laughs> way back when. And uh, my friend Norman said, oh, my bet Val would love to see this. And he was right. And I wound up using some of the information from this photo when I did the bull eye illustration, although it's obviously gasping for water before it died. Uh, this is just a little bit of my library. Back in the day, I had to rely heavily, heavily, heavily on books and other printed resources, but with the advent of the internet, I have a lot more information at my fingertips and do a lot of online research. I also take lots of photographs of my own. I am uh, blessed and cursed with a photographic memory. Uh, for better or for worse, every fish that I pull out of the water, I remember. And uh, not to say that I don't keep the photos, I do. I use these, and I never know when I'm going to use these. These are just some of the photos that I've taken in my travels. I also take pictures of dead fish because they are helpful in my work. And I take lots of pictures of juveniles. Again, never know when I'm going to use them. Turns out I am using them. I'm going to use that orange foulfish juvenile in my, in my upcoming book, and I use the juvenile spade fish um, in the uh, Atlantic and the Pacific book. I take lots of anatomy photos. Never know. Actually, the sheep's head teeth came in really handy when I illustrated the Chesapeake guy because we use that illustration in the appendix. This is just another sample of the uh, <laughs> deep diving that I have to do, I illustrated the rosy lip sculpin while I was watching video of it. Some kids had put the rosy lip sculpin in a tank and I illustrated this fish while I was hitting pause, play, pause, play, pause, play. When I can't find what I want on my own, I turn to my co-authors and uh, they are also very well connected and we keep casting a wider net until we eventually come up with the resources that I need to pull off the illustration. I'll give you an example. Mike Pinder up here with the salamander, the hellbender, we didn't have enough information to illustrate the orange Mad Tom, but he said, I know where they live. And he went off into the field and he bloody same some and he put one in a jar and he took photographs of it and he sent it to me and boom, I illustrated it for the book. That's just one example. This is my drafting table with the view that I have from the fish cave. That's the name of my office. I have two offices, one downstairs where my computers are and one upstairs, that's my drafting table. The lamps that you see are incandescent and fluorescent which um, simulates natural light. I have northern light and for the artists out there, you know, um, indirect northern light is the absolute best for any kind of artwork. And these are just some of the tools of my trade, which I'll show you now. I use a series of pencils. The ones on the left I use for drawing, the preliminary drawings. Uh, the ones in the middle I use to graphite up the back of the preliminary drawing when I transfer it. The ones on the right, these are very hard pencils. I use those to transfer the drawing to the ground, which is also the watercolor paper. The erasers down below, these are special tools. They're a pen click eraser. They're very soft. They don't harm the watercolor paper surface. The ones on the top I use on the watercolor paper and the ones on the bottom I use on the preliminary drawing so I don't mix them up. The ones on the bottom can get really smudgy and I don't wanna add the graphite to the uh, illustration. I use a special kind of tracing paper that's very fine tooth. Tooth means the a level of roughness on the paper. This is a very fine tooth paper and I have to order it special. And the tape above is an artist tape, which does not stick to the watercolor paper or to the tracing paper. So it doesn't tear the paper and it's archival as is the tracing paper. I use a lot of paintbrushes. I go through so many paintbrushes, I literally blunt them and I use a uh, washcloth to dab the paint and dab the uh, water off of the paintbrushes. I use two different cups, one for the initial dipping to get all the pigment out and the other one 
to get the rest of the pigment out. You don't wanna be sticking them in your mouth too often as I do because some of the pigment is toxic. So I try to rinse them off as much as possible between um, brush strokes. And the one on the, the right obviously is my secret weapon, it's toilet paper. <laughs> If I have an accident, I just roll that Scott tissue toilet paper across the across the watercolor paper and it picks it up very nicely and I can wad it into pointy tips and bowl, balls and, and different shapes to block the, uh, the pigment as well. So that's a, a secret weapon. This is my palette that I've been using since college. I added more wells on the right hand side. Uh, every artist has to form their own palette and they can put their paints wherever they're comfortable. There is no rule. You might learn a rule in school about the way a palette should be set up, but it's up to you and you're gonna get very used to the palette. I don't even have to think about my palette when I'm painting. It's kind of a Zen automatic thing. And uh, the watercolor is also very great for what I do because it lasts a long time and it's, uh, it's really, really flexible. Okay, so let's talk about actual illustration. So when I'm doing a preliminary drawing, I have to pay very close attention to uh, proportions. I liken the preliminary drawing to an architectural drawing. If the architectural drawing is wrong, then the building might be crooked, it might fall down. And so I take great care with the preliminary drawing to make sure that everything is correct. I count the spines, I count the rays, I even pay close attention to the cross hatching of the scales. And you'll notice that the scale patterns change from the breast uh, across the body and onto the tail. They often become larger on the sides and smaller towards the caudal peduncle. They will change shape and size on the cheeks. I've learned how to create different kinds of grids. And these are some examples of an oblique grid, a horizontal grid, and a recurve grid. A recurve grid is particularly challenging and that's the kind of grid that will go around the belly of a fish or if you can imagine around a snake, which is very, very challenging. So this is the Popeye Catalutha as I'm getting ready to transfer it to the ground. I finished the preliminary drawing. I've copied it onto regular paper. I have used my soft graphite pencil to graphite up the back of it. I've even fooled around with the size of the spines and the rays and I'm working on proportions here and I use this grid to lay it across the paper. So the middle, the middle line that you see is the mid axis or the midline of the fish. And that way I know that the, the illustration is not crooked on the page. Then I tape it down with that special tape that I mentioned and I use a really hard pencil, the number 6H or the number 9H. And I trace every single line that you see here onto the watercolor ground and it transfers the graphite onto the watercolor ground. You can barely, barely, barely make up the preliminary drawing here. And you can see the graphite on the back of the, of the preliminary drawing. So once this is done, I use a very, very sharp, large paintbrush. The reason why I use a large paintbrush instead of a small paintbrush is because a large paintbrush can hold more pigment than a small paintbrush. And they also can hold a, a, a point, a tip for much longer. So while my paintbrushes can be very expensive, I think the most expensive one that I bought was about $100. I want them to last a long time. And then once the tip is gone, I repurpose them. So once at this stage, I'm going over every single one of those graphite lines with the, with the pointed paintbrush. So I'm basically drawing it again for the fifth time. And then once I've got the outline, I use that really soft eraser to get rid of all the graphite. And I brush that away and I'm left with an outline in watercolor. And then I just start to paint. I've already done all my research. I know what it looks like. I have images of the Popeye Catalufa on my laptop, multiple, multiple, multiple images, but at this point it's in my brain. I don't have to think about it. I'll turn on my music, listen to a podcast and just keep layering the paint on and layering and layering very slowly, very methodically. I take my time, I don't rush. Rushing causes errors, errors are no good. Um, that said, one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was if you want to become a great scientific illustrator, you've got to make a million mistakes, so get started. 
So I still make mistakes, but I try not to because they're time consuming. Ta-da! So about eight hours later, this is what I've got. Finished Popeye cattle lufa, and you can see the mess on my table. But I'm not done with the process here. Once the illustration's done, I've got to I've got scan it, import it into Photoshop, and remove the paper background from the illustration so that I have a silhouette. This is what it looks like in InDesign. And I will use the cursor to remove all the background very carefully. I'm enlarging it. This is very time consuming. This could take up to an hour. But without it, I can't do a drop shadow effect. So I'm working on this book at this time. This is the California book. And this is what it looked like as I dropped the Popeye Catalufa in there with some cardinal fishes. I haven't added the text yet. So here it is with the text. And then once the text is all done and I have a whole section ready for my co-authors, I download that as a PDF and send that off to them for their comments and edits. Um, this is not the normal way that a book is created. <laughs> the normal way a book is created is the author does the words and the words go to the copy editor, back to the author, authors, back to the copy editor until they're done. The illustrator does the illustrator and the photographers do the photography. Map maker does the maps. And then all of that, once it's done, all the words have been edited, edited, edited. That goes to a designer and the designer spits out a book and the authors, illustrators have no idea what it looks like until it's done. The reason why we have chosen to use me as the author, illustrator, designer is so that we as the experts knew what we wanted, we knew what our audience wanted and I had the skill set to do it and my, my publisher just completely trusted me. So this is the way that we did it. Authors did their work, me, my co-authors, I was the illustrator. Uh, we had photo photographers, map makers, um, it went to me, to the copy editor, then the designer, and then it was going to publishing. Our books are published in China. There are very few uh, American publishers now. Uh, the quality is much better in China. And then once they have a whole bunch of books ready to be shipped back, they're on a container and they get into the warehouses and we all breathe a big sigh of relief. And then the really fun, fun part comes. I get to do a lot of book signings and meet people and it's a lot of fun. I have a great job. This is what it looks like in the copy editing process. Um, it's a hot mess. And my proofread, my copy editor uses proofreader marks. I just wanted you to see how um, detail oriented everybody is. So once a book is published, we know that it's, it's had a lot of eyeballs on it because it's a scientific book and it's a scientific press. And so we wanna make sure that everything is as accurate as can be. So there it is. There's Field Guide to Coastal Fishes from Alaska to California. And uh, I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Candace and uh, take any questions that anybody has. That was great. Thank you so much, Val. Um, I know I was excited when I saw initially, like, put your name together and I used your field guide in undergrad. I've gotten, like, I've seen you field guides when I go down to Key West. Uh, <laughs> your field guides she bought out in San Francisco. So that was really neat. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the Q&A session. So the first one was, do you ever draw fish under the water or do you only draw them once they're out of the water? Um, my job is to draw them at the surface of the water because when you go down to the depths, um, the water absorbs light. Yellow is the first to go, then orange, then red. So I don't want to illustrate the fishes when they're at depth. You also deal with turbidity, salinity, uh, movement. So I want them at the surface of the water. I hope that answers the question. Or in hand, that's the other term that we use for, for illustrating at the surface. And you want to do them alive rather than dead, or can you do freshly dead? Uh, fresh dead is sometimes useful. Uh, it's not the best situation. Sometimes that's all we've got. Um, some species are easy to use fresh dead. The tunas, for example, they're all pretty much silvery. You know, so if we have fresh dead, that can be useful. But like the dolphin fish, for example, they change colors really quickly. So I would never use a dead dolphin fish. Um, for living colors. All fishes change color with death. It's just inevitable. Gotcha. Um, the editing app, someone asked if, it, if it's Krita, are they correct or do you use a different editing app? I don't use an editing app. 
I use spell check and we use human eyeballs. Uh, I think it's for the fish when you go to take the fish off of the paper. Like the uh, I, oh, I use Photoshop. Cher wants to know what inspired you to pursue a career in scientific illustration? Oh gosh. <laughs> the abridged version. Uh, the, the small PG version is I always had art. I was always an artist from the time I could walk. I always was scribbling and drawing. I became class artist in high school. I took classes um, at the local Art Institute. I went to New York and took classes at Parsons School of Design. I was supposed to go to art school, but my art teachers hated my artwork. <laughs> they literally would redraw what I had drawn. They wanted me to become big and bold and impressionistic, and I lost all confidence in myself, and I changed my major to marine biology, which was my second passion. And by a long series of events that took me to the Florida Keys and then to Boston University and then to Greenland and then Bermuda and then the Virgin Islands and then Colorado, I wound up out at UC Santa Cruz and fell into the science illustration program by accident. It was absolute accident. I think that the fish gods had plans for me. So that's how I wound up doing what I do. And it was kind of a light bulb moment. I, I knew instantly what I wanted to do and it combined both of my passions. I got really, really lucky, essentially. That's amazing. Uh, we have a question. How important is that marine science background to your work? I think it's really important. Um, my father was an engineer, and so I have that brain for detail and order. And um, I have to pay very close attention to the scientific aspect of the fishes. I have to count scales, for example. Uh, there are different snooks and the difference between them could be the length of the anal fin spine and the number of scales above the lateral line. So along the way, I've been studying marine science in my work. And when my, I'm doing my research, I read a lot about the, the fishes and my subjects, not just fishes. I illustrate amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, you name it. When I get a job, for an aquarium, for example, they'd hand me a species list and there would be all kinds of animals on it. So I had to become very flexible as well. So I don't think necessarily it's, it's marine science, it's just science in, in general, if you have an appreciation for science, because there is no room for, for, for making it up. That's true. Um, I hope I answered the question. I think you did, yeah. Do you have a favorite species of all the illustrations you, or a favorite illustration that you've ever done? You know, the fishes that I love to illustrate the most are the ones that don't look like fishes. They don't walk, they don't swim like fishes. They don't behave like fishes. I'm thinking of bat fishes, toad fishes, uh, the flying gurnard, tripod fishes. They just, they defy any, any logic. Um, they're just, they're really fun to illustrate. Uh, although illustrating silvery fishes is fun too, because then I can let the watercolor kind of flow and I don't have to control it so much. I find them all fascinating because um, they, they all have found their own little niche, no matter how boring they may appear. And my job is to make them look the way they look. I can't, you know, I can't change it. Yes, that's awesome. So someone asked if you have mullet sketches, and I think now would be a good time to mention your website as well, maybe, so they can check out your other designs and everything. Mullet as in striped mullet, as in mullet mullet, as in fish? <laughs> yes, the fish mullet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've done them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've illustrated all the mullets of North America and the Caribbean Sea, not worldwide, North America and Caribbean Sea. So yeah, I've got all the mullet illustrations. Yeah, and what is that website that they can find all of that on? I have multiple websites. If you just Google Val Kells, uh, some of my book websites are going to come up. My Facebook, obviously, my Etsy website where I sell G clay prints. I'm kind of all over the place. There's pages and pages. And so if you want to reach out to me, you can, you can find me there and I'll answer any other questions or connect with anybody. Fantastic. It looks like our time is over, but Val, thank you so much for joining us today for Marine Science Day. It's always a pleasure and letting us learn more work about what you do as a scientific illustrator and your path there. It was amazing and I always love hearing about it. So thank you all for joining us and thank you Val for being with us this morning.
Thank you everyone for, for coming. And I hope that you leave here with a little bit of, I don't know, love for the sea. <laughs>